So, um, yeah, hi and welcome to the last in the series of webinars uh, related to the uh, Royal College of Psychiatry's Net Zero Mental Health Report. Um, I'm Emma Clark, the Energy, Waste and Sustainability Manager at Bradford District Care Trust. Um, so I'm going to um, host and chair today. Um, the session will be recorded, so um, do please stay on mute if you're not speaking. Um, the, this webinar recording and the others are all going to be available um, online. There's a slide at the end with a QR code, so you'll be able to scan that to take you directly to where um, the team have, have um, saved all of the previous webinars and where this recording will go. So today we're focusing on two overarching recommendations looking at um, developing leadership and workforce learning and development infrastructure to support the transition to net zero and building a sustainable and responsible mental health workforce focus on looking towards the future. So we're looking at examples of creating system-wide change through innovative approaches to leadership and staff training. We have Monica from the Midlands Partnership University NHS Foundation Trust discussing some of the creative changes that they've implemented, including the development of a sustainability champions group, a green social prescribing group, and a green clinical practice group. This will include discussion around the benefit, the barriers, sorry, to bringing about these changes and the benefits that they've seen to date. Then we're going to hear from Sean, um, who's the People Participation Lead for Environmental Sustainability at East London NHS Foundation Trust, and then um, she'll be discussing the creation of her role and service user staff involvement in the Trust Screen Plan. So please do use the chat, um, you know, just between yourselves or to, to, to highlight any questions that you've got for our presenters today. If it's a point of clarification, we'll ask it straight after the um, that the presentation's ended. Otherwise, we'll leave um, all questions for the Q&A at the end. And we think there should be plenty of time, so do get your, your thinking caps on for some questions for our panel. Um, if you think someone else's question's really, really um, important and useful, please do give it a thumbs up because then we'll prioritise the questions that most people think are worth, um, they want answers to. Okay, so we'll get straight into our first presentation, which is, um, from uh, Monica Hornikova, who's the Sustainability Manager at the Midlands Partnership University NHS Foundation Trust. So Monica's part of a small green team and leads the delivery of the Green Plan, their net zero targets and sustainable development within the Trust. Monica became an honorary, that's a hard word to say, honorary lecturer at Keele University earlier this year and she joined um, the Trust in 2017 after beginning her sustainability energy management career in 2013 after completing an MSc in environmental management at the University of Wolverhampton. So straight over to you, Monica, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. So today I will speak to you, I will try to show you a brief overview of what we do in MPFT and how we integrate sustainable practice into leadership systems and workforce in MPFT. Next slide, please. Committing to sustainability shows that the organization cares about the environment and the health and well-being of current and prospective employees. If the organization has strong environmental sustainability practices and promotes them well, a staff may be more likely to stay or accept the job within with our organization. So we embrace sustainability as a strategic priority in our green plan and in overall. So leaders can inspire their teams to create positive social, environmental and economic impact contribute to a more sustainable future for all. Systems also play an important role in sustainability because all NHS trusts are required to have uh, green plans in place in order to deliver net zero. Integrated care systems have their green um, delivery plans and the suppliers and partner organizations need to accommodate and show their commitment to reducing carbon emissions as well. The organization needs to have a team, tools and governance in place to support the net zero commitment. Next slide, please. The Strategic Sustainability Group was first established in 2019 to monitor and deliver the objectives of the former Sustainable Development Management Plan. When the NHS Net Zero strategy was introduced in 2020, and all trusts had to have a green plan in place starting from April 2022, the SSG objectives changed to accommodate green plan and net zero delivery. The Strategic Sustainability Group was conceived in recognition of the fact that there were no established governance processes in place to support the Trust Green Plan delivery as well as the National NHS Net Zero Strategy. 
This strategy set out a vision to become a net zero carbon health service and resp respond to climate change, improving health now and for future generations. There is a strong and growing desire within the trust to demonstrate real commitment to sustainability and clear ethical and economic arguments for doing so. So the national greener NHS agenda, greener NHS and green programs across integrated care systems also drive this um, and also drive this. Next slide, please. Strategic Sustainability Group is director-led and membership combines green, uh, green team, green plan leads, managing directors, clinical directors from all care groups and corporate teams such as finance and communication teams. Um, sustainability Strategy Group includes all leaders across the trust and they all together make decisions and plans and own the strategy and action plan together. So it's not just green team's responsibility to deliver the plan. SSG objectives are to deliver actions as per the green plan, achieve outcomes set as per national NHS net zero strategy, which is building more resilient healthcare system that understands and is responding to the direct and indirect threats posed by climate change, improving health and patient care and reducing health inequalities. SSG also provides updates and assurance on carbon reduction targets. This is achieved through regular updates on national, regional and local targets led by the Green Plan leads. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. We are looking to re redesign our green corporate responsibilities throughout an employee's career journey and provide opportunities to collect feedback and continuously review our green practices. This will happen through, throughout the green recruitment and policies, green management and reviews, green training and development, green engagement and health and well-being via SUV resources, a green reward systems such as internal green awards, um, and um, via exit strategy and review. These teams will focus on aspects around engagement, education and promotion. The content within these sections will feature in MPFT's people strategy to aid in embedding a greener future workforce. Next slide, please. We support in various ways uh, and we are always looking to include more ways to do so. Sustainability awareness is incorporated into job description and inductions. Our internal greener site is one stop for all sustainability initiatives and includes the MPFT green plan, information on sustainability networks, case studies, training opportunities, new articles and much more. The staff is supported with recommended sustainability awareness training, carbon literacy training and incorporated sustainability into quality improvement training. Next slide, please. The Sustainability Champions Group was formed in 2018 with the aim to engage staff interested in sustainability to help shape sustainable future for the trust. We now have over 100 sustainability champions. We tried a few delivery methods and tools to engage champions more. When we saw a lack of engagement, we asked them to complete a short survey. The survey showed us that the champions preferred online quarterly meetings. They liked discussions updates and learning in the form of presentations. We implemented all of those suggestions and we've seen increase in meeting attendance and engagement on the team's channel dedicated to the champions. In 2022, this, oh, sorry, next slide, please. In 2022, the sustainability champions planned and delivered four projects. The first project was Grow Your Own Sunflower. Um, we worked with the co-op and uh, they donated thousands of sunflower seeds packets and uh, we distributed them to the hospitals, clinics, health centers and offices within our organization. We received feedback from service users on the positive impact of watching the sunflowers grow and how the children enjoyed growing them as well. During Sustainability Day, a sustainability champions promoted sustainability by sharing plants and seedlings and talking to staff, patients and service users about our green plan. We received another positive feedback how this project helped people's well-being. Some commented that they couldn't believe that seedlings were free of charge. In September uh, 2022, we shared our produce and the, uh, at the clinics. And Champions created online poster to share ideas with staff on how to be more sustainable at work and at home. Next slide, please. 
Greener Clinical Practice was established last year. This is a networking group for any service leads, team managers, clinicians interested in, <clears throat> excuse me, in changing clinical practice to reduce our carbon footprint as a trust. The group shares sustainable ideas and good practices in the clinical environment and participates in measurable change projects. For example, the Take Your Gloves Off campaign was reduce, um, reduce the inappropriate use of gloves by 16% in five words. By inappropriate use, I mean using gloves when it's um, not necessary. For example, when making the bed, giving out medication or talking to patients. Infection control nurses and the team introduce green checklists in clinics. Stable service introduced pop-up clinics and use SASQI methodology to measure and calculate environmental, social, and financial savings with Green Team's help, which were shared at a greener clinical practice meeting with others. We also got all those examples on our greener team site um, that we share with our staff, service users, and uh, visitors. Next slide, please. Cycling for the Climate um, Group is the latest sustainability network, um, and it's um, another sustainable network led by staff who enjoy cycling and advocate for sustainable travel at work. They don't have a meetings, but they share useful tips and they um, communicate via the network channels. Next slide, please. So the green team sits within the quality and clinical performance and professional directorate and was established in the summer last year. The green team leads the delivery of the green plan, steer the SSG and the green plan leads. The green team also leads the sustainability networks and links and advises clinical and corporate leads within the trust on the best sustainable practice. We work with clinical and corporate teams to embed sustainability into all trust business from business planning, strategies, projects, sustainability team flag assessments, the trust board reports um, to attending and presenting at care groups, governance meetings. We place green agenda into already established programs and projects, such as um, quality improvement team incorporated sustainability in their training and projects. The green team is connected to regional, national networks and ICS and ICB partners to help deliver the ICS green objectives. We also work in partnership with the Keele University on embedding sustainability in nursing curriculum. So this was a summary of how we integrate sustainable practice into leadership, how we engage our staff, and how we work as a system and connect tools and practices so collectively we can deliver the net zero agenda. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and thank you for listening. That's great. Thank you, Monica. Um, did anybody have any points of clarification before we move on? Any hands going up? No? Okay. I've got some questions, but like I say, I'll leave them to the end and I'm sure other people have as well. Really interesting things that certainly I should be trying to follow up and um, plagiarise within our trust. Um, okay, let's move on to... Uh, Sean, then, I think um, I'm assuming that the slides will just seamlessly move across, and yes, they do. So we have got um, Sean now, who is a service user from Luton and was one of the service user representatives in the um, expert reference groups that put, um, helped to, to put the report together with RC Sykes. So um, since being part of the ERG, Sean started a new role um, in the trust which is East London Foundation Trust as a people participation lead for sustainability. And she's going to talk a little bit more about that now. Thank you, Emma. Yes, yeah, so today I'll be talking about the value of service users and carers and their role in shaping the workforce at ELFT um, and how they are vital for supporting the shift to sustainable care. So I'll focus a little bit on patient empowerment, um, as this is one of the overarching principles of net zero healthcare, considered to be vital to achieve greener, lower carbon and sustainable health services, which was derived from the research findings of the RC Psych report. Could I have the next slide, please? 
So we often think of empowerment as giving people the tools to manage their own mental health and to have control over their own care and treatment as much as possible. So you might have seen this diagram before, rather than simply engaging and involving people in their care decisions, we feel that you should be aiming for co-production. So changing and delivering mental health care in, in equal partnership and reciprocal partnership with service users and carers, um, though this requires fundamental change throughout the organisation in how it perceives and therefore works with service users and carers as expert partners in their care. Could I have the next slide, please? So at ELFT, we believe that service users and carers should be involved in all aspects of care delivery. So this is just a selection of some of the things that our service users um, are involved in across the trust. So this could be sitting on interview panels. Um, every interview panel in the trust, we believe a service user representative should be on, um, from hiring directors to clinical staff to administrators. Um, our service users and carers are in, um, involved in designing and delivering research projects, quality improvement projects, um, facilitating training, reviewing and co-producing policies and procedures. So in all of this work, our service users and carers are recognised for their expertise and are therefore paid for their contribution. Um, but they can also access training themselves, both within the trust and outside of it. This could be around how to chair a meeting, QI training, the list goes on. Um, and just to kind of hammer in, so service users are on in every interview panel, every improvement project and every policy change, um, to name a few. So we're not tokenistic. We believe that service users should be involved in everything. So could I have the next slide, please? Um, what do service users get out of it? So um, some of the service users from our trust explored the experiences of people participation and its benefits to patient recovery. And here are some of the findings. Um, so to give back to the service, to influence positive change, to keep, keep occupied, um, and also that these activities help their recovery through feeling productive, having a voice and improving services, um, learning or refreshing skills and support from the people participation workers. Could I have the next slide, please? So this is some of our team. Um, at our people participation conference, which kind of highlighted all the work that we're doing within the directorate. Um, and here are a few quotes about the impact of people participation on the lives of our service users and carers. Could I have the next slide, please? So at ELFT, we have an entire directorate responsible for supporting service users and carers into this work in the trust. So I could not fit the entire team on here. But there are over 200 staff in our directorate um, who all have lived experience, either as a service user or a carer, from our director all the way down. Um, so we've got the support services on, on the right on the left, sorry. Um, and we've got the people participation on, on the other side. And it's the role of our people participation leads to support and empower the participation of service users and carers um, of ELFT in those different opportunities. Um, so the directorate employs over 40 people participation leads and people participation workers who are embedded in every directorate across the trust. And this is a list of, of some of the um, directorates we're involved in. So you've got kind of area based adult mental health services and child and adolescent mental health services, um, forensics, estates, perinatal um, and sustainability now. So um, as leads, we're responsible for supporting people in those um, projects. Um, but we're also responsible for focusing on pathways out of people participation um, focusing on what's next for individuals. So this might mean that they could go on to become peer support workers, befrienders or people participation workers, PPLs themselves. Um, and this was my journey. So I started out um, in people participation, uh, doing kind of interview panels, sitting in on projects. Um, in 2021 and I sat on the interview panels and project meetings um, within kind of loads of different directorates in my in my local area and, and outside um, and I had an or I already had a passion for environmental sustainability so when I found the climate network around a year and a half ago I felt right at home. Um, could I have the next slide please? And, and like Emma said so since 
being part of the ERG, I've become ELF's PPL for environmental sustainability. And my job is specifically to support service users who want to work on sustainability projects. Um, so I'm one of the four climate network leads and each of us has a slightly different role in the network. We've got two clinical leads, um, a lead for estates and then myself. We facilitate a range of meetings, projects and presentations to the trust with the aim to raise awareness of the health and social impacts related to clim the climate and ecological crisis and also to encourage actions to limit our trust's carbon emissions. Um, so these are some of the projects that are going on. We've got a monthly meeting where anyone who signed up to the climate network meeting, uh, sorry, to the climate network can join that service users and staff. Um, we have six climate network work streams which are associated with our green plan. Um, I think we're hoping to to um, start some new ones as well, but we've we've kind of identified those six areas. Um, and my first job was to get service users and carers on board, but it didn't take much encouraging. Since I started my role in August, I have had 35 service users and carers join the network. This includes representation across our trust, so East London and Beds and Luton, um, from services including adult mental health services, community health, older adults and CAMS. Um, and their input in these meetings has been so valuable already. Um, as we look to design and deliver more sustainable models of care or change our prescribing practices, for example, it is vital that we have people like me who have the experience of receiving this care working on these projects from the start. Um, and in September, I started a working together group for service users and carers. So this is people participation only meeting um, who are interested in sustainability. And one of the members um, called this group LEAF, short for Leading Environmental Action Forwards, which was initially set up just to support um, their involvement in the climate network and associated work streams. But even in its infancy, our participants are showing interest in starting their own patient led initiatives. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So these are some of the change ideas that have come from our working together groups already. So our service users and carers would like access to training and education around sustainable mental health care. Uh, we want to co-design our green plan. Uh, we want support for people with eco distress. We're looking at peer led recovery college sessions um, around understanding climate change. Um, and also we want to set sustainability as a priority for the people participation directorate. So we want to see it in our annual plan. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So why do our service users and carers want to be involved specifically in the sustainability work we're doing? So I've got a couple of quotes here from from feedback from people that have joined these meetings. Um, I think kind of to sum it all, the climate and ecological crisis is felt by our service users and carers who are in turn fundamental in leading system change. Could I have the next slide, please? So empowering service users and carers through people participation can reduce the need for services, build skills and add meaningful activity to people's lives while bringing a fresh and valuable perspective when enacting system change. This can build better understanding and relationships between staff and service users, which all results in more sustainable healthcare outcomes through keeping people well um, in empowerment and participation and collectively creating the right care pathways while involving the entire workforce um, including our service users and carers. So they're just some of the co-benefits. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Brilliant. So I was asked to um, give some information on how to start people participation. Um, it was a big ask from my from my manager. She didn't know <laughs> to give you, I think you could probably do a, a day's worth of, of trying to get um of how to start people participation. Um, but our best advice for those of you who may want to involve service users and carers more is to start somewhere or start anywhere. So um, this could be training, which, you know, kind of already happens across many trusts already. Um, I'm thinking about sort of cuff training and knowledge and understanding framework and replicating that to your own training. Um, you could support service users to sit on interview panels. Um, you need dedicated staff um, for this work. So it's not enough to put this into part of somebody's um, job role when wanting to involve service users. We feel this role should also be filled um, ideally by somebody with lived experience. Um, and thirdly, you need to invest. So as mentioned, it's crucial that you recognise service users for their valued expertise. You can't build a directorate in a day. This was our people participation team in 2008. 
we only had three people participation leads um but it can kind of grow the more more kind of uh i suppose the more you invest in it and the more you get the workforce on on board the hardest bit is getting started um but if you start somewhere you can go everywhere i think that's everything thank you That's great. Okay, so there is um uh let's say opportunity, plenty of opportunity now for us to to ask questions, have a bit of a discussion. And if I find the chat, oh I got I somehow managed to chuck myself out, so I've lost a a question, I think. But there was one, I think it was from Susanna, it was asked um, aimed at Monica, but it links to Sean's question and Please correct me if I get this wrong, but um, the question to Monica was, is there a place for service users and carers within the green team in, in um, your trust? Um, so if Susanna could clarify the question, if she means um, if she means job opportunity or more collaboration with service users. Susanna, feel free to clarify. I'm assuming you mean um, collaboration rather than... Um, paid roles but I don't know okay if so I've got if that one Susanna please put it in the chat <laughs> if it's a collaboration then we already are doing some work with service users um, and I can talk about it um, but now uh, watching Sean, um, Sean presentation um, there is much more we can do and I'm uh, inspired the presentation was brilliant Sean Jack, uh, thank you so there is much more we can do um, we are linking, we are including our service users into all our quality improvement projects. We are introducing co-production. My colleague Fiona, who sits within continuous improvement team, uh, she's leading on it. We've got a director for live experience. So we are trying to incorporate um, co-produce. Um, uh, any projects are, um, we are trying to incorporate co-production within all projects. Um, we are also working with service users on um, green awards. Um, on come up with the questions and also uh, then in the later later stage and we are working with our green plan leads for green social prescribing we are working with her um so the the course is um, social prescribing course is co-produced and led by service user uh, via recovery college okay great um so Susanna hopefully that does answer the question I see you've tried to clarify about um co-production um and yeah i guess the answer is you can't do co-production without your service users hopefully um monica's explained what they're doing but if you've got another question please put it back into the chat um so there's a question for sean um how has it been getting employees engaged with um with the topic i guess Um, I think it's a bit of a mixed bag. I think um, meeting a lot of staff, I think the the, the overarching feeling I get um, is that people just feel like they don't know where to start. Um, they feel overwhelmed and really kind of, um, yeah, I guess just, just stressed about it, don't know how to fit it into their job. I'm hoping that this report will give us a bit of a boost. It will be somewhere um, with those recommendations in the report that we can direct people to. But in terms of um, kind of service users being involved in this, I think um, there's been a couple of times where I felt that maybe staff were confused about why service users were involved in sustainability. But overall, it has made, you know, I think because we have such a um, a culture within our trust that service users are involved in everything that you know it's the the need for it isn't questioned and certainly within our climate network leads it's been um you know incredibly valued um to have the service user input i hope that answered the question okay great thank you um so are there any ideas at either trust to move towards a plant-based diet in inpatient units um so someone's saying that i believe that this could fall under uh, sustainable practice and would be a big statement of leadership from the trust oh, that's from Liam so yeah could, perhaps a question to both of you so our trust in MPFD um, our patient inpatient units got plant-based diets is, is an option 
so the patients got an option uh, to choose uh, what meal they want if they want um, meat or plant-based diet. Also, our staff got that options as well. So we, we do offer it to patients. But there's no intention of going 100% plant-based? Not yet, no, because then um, you would have other patients and staff who would like to eat meat. So really, it's um, accommodating all and giving options. Okay. Sean? Yeah, I think ours is a similar um, situation, and I don't foresee us ma making a 100% switch anytime soon. I think because within sort of nutrition, there's a lot of other things to consider. I mean, I'd, I'd love for us to move to 100% um, hundred percent vegetarian or vegan, but um, I think there's a lot more to consider with nutrition in terms of health um, that we're kind of factoring in when we're making those decisions. Sure, okay. Um, I think I missed a point of clarification from Susanna about your the question to you, Monica, about um, involvement of service users. Um, and so she's, she's asking, so why are service users and carers not visible in the green team? So I don't know, Susanna, if, if, if you felt that Monica's response didn't quite answer that question, but I don't know if there's anything else, Susanna. Um, Monica, you wanted to add to the response before. Well, the co-production is done with service users, and I'm not sure what Susanna means, that uh, they're not visible in the green team. We've got other team, other staff who just work with service users. Their main job is co-production. We've got a director who does video co-production. It's not part of the green team. It's different team, but green team and co-production team works together well. And if there is a opportunity for projects to include co-production, then of, of course it's done with service users. Okay, so it does seem like there's quite a lot going on and it does happen, but then on the graphic, it wasn't a, a specific uh, a okay. specific point. So hopefully that's, that's um, boxed that one off. Okay, so I've got a question for Sean now. Um, I'm hoping I'll get to my questions at some point, but yeah, I'll keep going through these for now. Um, what differences do you see from having all staff members in the team having lived experience of mental health issues? Do you think that helps in terms terms of communication and understanding of things yeah I think so and I think um the last slide about kind of how to replicate it I think this is really the reason why it's important to if you're looking to start some form of people participation to have um you know staff members with lived experience I think it makes all the difference you know we're all um it kind of creates a sense of of community um, for our service users and carers and a kind of a way of modelling. You know, I could go into um, people participation and see people like me and, and find hope because there was times in my recovery journey where I thought I wasn't going to have a job. I wasn't going to get um, to, you know, have a role in sustainability. And although my role in sustainability isn't kind of what I thought it would be, you know, working for a sustainability company, I'm now working um, in a team of like-minded people um, using my experience and my passion for sustainability and I think it does um, it does make all the difference and it helps to challenge any kind of um, any views from people that don't have that that lived experience I think it helps to to challenge that stigma um, so yeah sure okay um, well, whilst other people think of some of their questions, I've got one for, for, for Monica and then one for, for Sean. So Monica, I'm quite interested in the greener clinical practice um, work that you do. Certainly within my trust, I'm sure there are hundreds of staff that are really interested in this in their personal life, but just because of other workforce pressures, can't lift their head above the parapet to start thinking about greener practice too much. It's changing a little bit, but perhaps not as quick as someone that like my role, your role with, with one. So I'm really interested to understand, did the greener clinical practice, did that, you know, did that get set up because it was clinician led or was that kind of the green team um, go, going to clinicians and trying to ask for people to, to participate and just sort of how active are they and and how much how much do they lead and how much does the green team sort of have to, have to do? Just like to hear a little bit more about that, please, Monica. Okay. So that's a bit both. And uh, I'm sure that other trusts and organizations who already got um, sustainability networks where they need to involve, when they are involved in staff, 
I'm sure everybody's got the same challenge. Um, so first, there was a demand for um, for the network and clinicians wanted to be more involved with the sustainability. So we had sustainability champions network first, but we felt like that was more general sustainability rather than um, rather than focusing on sustainability and sustainable practices and projects within the clinical environment. Um, like with, um, maybe many of you will agree with me, like with any other networks, um, there is a lack of time of the clinicians and maybe people are shy and they don't want to run the networks. Maybe they don't want that responsibility to lead on something. So that's why um, we felt in a green team um, that maybe we, if we started sharing it, we started leading it first, first few meetings then, um, that it would be easier for them. We would accommodate them. They would have an opportunity to discuss, ask questions, and then um, share them, steer them in the right direction so they can share the projects. Um, we offered um, for the clinicians to chair the meetings, and that was done a few times. Uh, we helped them with the agenda. We support them with um, admin and everything they need. So we participated, um, we, we lead, but um, they have an opportunity to share and then uh, bring any topics, uh, any questions for discussions. Um, we found that sharing the best practice works really well. There is a difference between sustainability champions and cre uh, greener clinical practice. Sustainability champions, we've got over hundreds, um, but it's really hard to get them engaged. Uh, yes, we were very productive last year, but this year we slowed down a little bit and we think it's because we've got more participants and it's a little bit harder. And everybody's got different interests. Um, so with greener clinical practice, it's a specific aim. Uh, we still discuss, they still got some questions, general questions, uh, like on waste and recycling. Um, but we try to steer them right direction. I try them to help us with green plan, try to embed sustainability within, uh, within all projects they do. Um, sometimes they just need to help and advice. They already, many clinicians already got sustainability projects. They just don't know it's sustainability. They don't know they are contributing to sustainability. So when we talk to them, they said, oh yeah, it's now clear. We know exactly what we are doing. And we help them uh, to include SASQI methodology in their projects. Uh, we help them to calculate environmental, social, and financial impact. We support them with calculations, with presentations and everything. They are already doing it. It's just they need that advice and steer, yes. Um, you are contributing to sustainability. And once they see the, um, the impact, um, what, what it does in, in our terms, this is a sustainability world, then, uh, then they get it, they share it with others. And we found it, it's working really well. Okay, so just a quick follow up on that one then. So you showed the green checklist, and I think you mentioned infection prevention. So is that is that a green checklist for all sust uh, sort of clinical sustainability? No, so the, the checklist specifically for IPC work. Um, no, the checklist uh, was done by IPC team because IPC team is part of Greener Clinical Practice Network. They are members, and um, uh, part of being Greener Clinical Practice Network initiatives, they created proactively created checklists for um, dental team for uh, vaccination. Um, and um, for uh, ambulance services as well, I think. So it's not a general, it's specific to the clinic. Great, okay. Um, and then Sean, if I could come to you, I suppose it's a similar sort of question. Like you, um, you showed some examples of the, um, the, the, the sort of patient top, of the topics that the, the patient group, the LEAF group have been looking at. But I was wondering if you could maybe go into a little bit more detail about what, they, what they're actually, what they're actually doing and who's kind of contributing what um, as part of those projects. Yeah, so thank you, Emma. Um, we've only had two meetings so far. So we started the um, we started the working together group in September, um, and we had yeah we had one in September and one in in October. Um, we're currently setting our priorities and objectives and kind of uh, seeing where to start whether this fits into projects that are currently happening in the trust or whether this is projects that we set up um on our own i did put a little box to sort of say that you know i'm hoping in the next year we do see some of these service user-led initiatives um we've definitely got some things to learn from 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 monica as well there are some really great projects that we could we could also steal um 
and start our own. But yeah, at the moment, uh, we are just kind of in the deciding what to do stage. Um, but thank you, Emma. Okay. So just related before I say there's another question in the in the chat. So you said you've got 35 now as part of the the net the network. Um just a sort of practical thing, how did you communicate with them to recruit and things like that? Do you have a, a um like trust Facebook? Did it just go through the people participation team as a as a kind of call out? How did you um recruit that interest? Yeah, so there's there's kind of um some of our people participation leads are, are purely area based so they they will um kind of look after one area of service users so that might be service users in bedford for example um, and then we have some trust wide ones so i i can have anyone on on my kind of mailing list from from across the trust um and i've got a couple of ways of of doing that either i go to other those kind of area based working together groups um who will be specifically looking at service improvement projects in Bedford. And then I can go and speak to them and see if there's any interest or bring some of their service users on board. Um, and the other way is to kind of go to some of these, to some of our community hubs. So we have um, a few areas where there'll be kind of um, groups of service users who come for the for the day um, to in kind of join in on activities. And then I could look at, um, yeah, kind of recruiting my own or I suppose poaching them from other um other people participation needs but we have this kind of people participation network that um an email channel that i can kind of email out to all the other people participation leads and um see if there's any interest of that in their group um so you might have one service user in bedford who is doing improvement projects in bedford also doing some sustainability work also doing some work with estates um and maybe the kind of local perinatal team so they could be doing several different things that interest them um, at the moment, I've not done too much of the recruitment because I'm fairly new and on limited hours, but um, I'm hoping to get out there. OK, great. Um, so I've got a question for um, Monica from Andrew saying, um, do you have, well, so perhaps also for Sean, but I think it's probably ended, Monica. Do you have specific tools that you use to measure the environmental impact in QI projects? Um, oh, you just replied, so yeah. you use the sense for, sorry, but maybe you could explain that a little bit more to the rest of the group. Okay. Yeah, so we use, um, we link with Centre for Sustainable um, Healthcare. We are um, beacon, site, beacon site now um, with them. So we work with them over one month. Um, well, QI team, our QI team led on it with our help. Um, and um, they created carbon footprint, fu footprint calculations and all methodology and guide um, how to um, how to measure it, um, how to find out if the project got environmental um, will have environmental measures. Because I think um, if you are if you got staff who are um, not in sustainability teams, you know you can have any clinicians, you can have admin, someone from digital. They might not see that they're. Um, that their project can measure environmental impact, um, then um, I think Centre for Sustainable Healthcare, not I think, Centre for Sustainable Health, Healthcare, they created methodology and uh, prompts how to first map it if there are environmental impacts and then how to measure it via carbon footprint calculations. So they provided full guide how to do it. So what about this? So you mentioned social as well as environmental and financial calculations does, yeah. does, can you get social calculations from the center I, sustainable health care is working I well don't or is that so. something separate i don't think so that's something separate so the social impact is already within qi measures that our team uses mm -hmm. and i'm not sure if every qi team uh, uses the same measures within all nature stress i am not sure but for example um what we include as a social measure, social impact would be staffs and patients time, uh, would be involvement of the patient. Uh, we've got a few QI projects. I've done one um, where we involve service users. Uh, we ask them the questions, told them the facts about um, what the project is about. Um, uh, it was a reduction of single use plastic caps and spoons um, within the medication on inpatient eating disorder ward. We involved them uh, before I even spoke to the clinicians, patients. It was led by the patients on that ward. They came up with the ideas, very good ideas, and it helped us to introduce the change. 
Um, so it was uh, the project saved on uh, staff's time. Uh, we also did a survey with the staff and the patients before mm -hmm. and after. Uh, the staff was happier, but also the patients felt like they were a part of something that they could contribute to something bigger, bigger change. And uh, we empowered them. Um, uh, so before the clinicians came to the patient to deliver the medication, uh, and they use a huge amount of the plastic cups and spoons and, and water. Um, after the project, uh, the patients came up with it. Patients were able to come to the clinician with their cup of water they already had before when they um, ha ha had a break or they were sitting in the lounge. Um, so, or they drank the medication with a cup of coffee or tea. So they were empowered. They were in the charge how they received the medication. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, I don't think there's any more questions in the chat unless I've missed anything, but someone at HQ will tell me if I have. Uh, um, no, I've got all the questions, I think, from the Q&A. So, yeah, if I um, just waffle on for another few seconds, it gives people time to maybe put something in the chat if they have got a big... in question to ask i'm also being, being the chair and i need to do the the qr code so you're going to just have to bear with me while i do that as well because otherwise i think it's going to disappear before um when when our hosts delete it so yeah just please bear with me while i do that there we go i'm in okay so anyone managed to put something in the chat or got any final questions emma i think there's someone with their hand up um oh is there oh i can't see that okay if someone's got their hand up, is it Robert? I can't see that. Oh, do you want to um, take yourself off mute and ask the question, Robert? I'm okay. Can you hear me? There we go. We can hear you. Yet, yeah, go for it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, uh, I used to work in the rehabilitation units uh, in Burning and Solihull Mental Health Trust, and we have the same experience doing some guards hanging uh, outside of the unit and it was a lot of positive feedback from the patient and we have the a good effect for the patient uh, behavior aggressive behavior and Jana, Jana, I follow this subject because I'm still interested in this uh, this using the nature to to reduce uh, for a modified the behavior for the patient, the mental state, and I just, I just follow and I'm happy that they are, they are more structured for this subject and uh, I just happy to try to follow this, this issue. It is very interesting and I see, keep eye on this one. These are the reflection, the question. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I mean, there is one of the recommendations in the, in the report is about sort of green therapy and it's certainly something we're looking at in our trust and I know others are um Monica sort of alluded to doing green social prescribing down in the Midlands mm -hmm. and then um, not they're doing quite a lot I'm sure lots of people are so um yeah it may be that yeah, my background is, is a consultant is psychiatrist and we use the disease roman to modify behavior for the patient and and it's, it was very mm. positive interesting subject yeah absolutely absolutely let's say mm. hopefully there'll be a bit more um integration of some of this um as a result of the report but yeah okay thanks for your reflection there All is right. there any yes. other is there any other hands up that i've missed no okay well in that case if nobody's got any final final questions i'll give everybody 10 minutes of their day back on this um friday Thank you for your contributions and obviously a, a big um, sort of virtual round of applause to, to both Sean and, and Monica. Um, it's always can be a bit daunting to uh, to do these sorts of things, so um, we're very grateful to them. Um, if you haven't, do please obviously scan the QR code or, or follow that link to the Knowledge Hub uh, where you'll be able to find the previous webinars and I'm sure this one very shortly if you want to follow up. Um, and I'm sure anybody, whether it's, it's um, the CCQI HQ or, or, or part of the panel will be um, happy to, 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 to take um, conversations forward. I certainly am if anybody ever wants to chat about sustainability stuff, always happy to talk. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, we'll bring this session to a close.